I want to I wanna read from uh, verse 9, and I'm going to focus on one verse. But I want to give a bit of context. Beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your works and labor of love, which you have shown to reward his name. You have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abram, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself." saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. So after that he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. I want to speak today about inheriting the promises of God, because that's how God gives you something. He makes a promise to you, and when you believe it, you receive it. That's how God works. He makes promises, and his book is full of promises. His book is full of promises. But this passage today speaks about, I call them the, uh, the power twins. The power twins of the promise. How promises actually become real and manifest and how we start to say, I've received from God, is, is through these two power twins It says, see that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I want to speak about faith and patience today because uh, it's very, very important that we know how God produces victory in our life, how we overcome. And uh, sometimes you can have faith without patience, or faith with impatience in your prayer. And it's dangerous. John the Baptist was in prison, and he had faith, and he actually saw the dove land on Jesus, and he heard the voice of God say, he's my son. And then he was in prison. Himself, he was in prison. And everybody else was getting free. And he wasn't getting free. And he was in prison. Sometimes uh, you are believing for your miracle and everyone else is receiving something from God around them. People are giving testimonies what God's done for them, but he's not working for you. That's what John the Baptist was like. And he ran out of patience. And when he went to Jesus... Jesus said, blessed are those who are not offended. Who are not offended. When he saw other people getting their breakthrough, he wasn't getting his. Instead of being patient for his, he became offended. And when you become offended with God, it's a very, very dangerous place to be. So many people are just not in church today because they became offended with God. They were believing for something and other people got blessed, but they didn't get blessed. And they fell away because they couldn't wait on God. So they had faith, but they didn't have faith with patience. And the word patience in the scripture in the Hebrew, it speaks about enduring, but it also speaks about enduring with the capacity to be offended, to be disappointed, to continue to believe God in the midst of disappointment, in the midst of betrayal, uh, being able to continue to trust God when people do the wrong th- thing by you, but not avenging uh, yourself, trusting God with all that, enduring patiently, walking in love, and, and continuing to trust in the goodness of God and in the goodness and, and, and faithfulness of God to perform His Word to you. And some people here, you know, God has given you a word. You know you've got your word. God has quickened you. It's been remit to you. Maybe your children are away from God and God has told you, which is true, that salvation is for you and your whole household. And you've got that word and you're believing that word, but you need to mix that word with patience. If you, you're someone in your, fa- in your family has got cancer and you're believing for them, you need to believe that by the wounds of Jesus we have our healing, but you need to continue to believe that and continue to patiently believe and wait on God and continue to endure 
uh, in all areas that we're believing for. Maybe it's to do with a ministry God's promised you, that, that you, you believe God has promised you a ministry, and you believe that. Maybe it's a job. God has promised you a job or a financial thing. God has, God has given you his word that he is able to provide all your need according to the riches in Christ Jesus, but you've still got the bills. You're believing God and the bills are still there. Maybe you believe in God for a job, but the door hasn't opened yet. God says you're going to inherit that promise, my goodness to you, the goodness to my child, but you're actually going to inherit what God promised you. I want to just tell you about the faithfulness of God. When I was 15 years old, God told me I would preach the gospel to nations. And it was impossible. It was impossible. Even, even a few years ago, it was impossible. I want to tell you, God performs and perfects his word. God gives promises, and he wants us to be able to inherit those promises. And it's through faith and patience. When will you inherit the promise God gives you? When you believe and trust in his word alone. Alone. When you believe that God is just going to do it because he is God and he has said it. No other way. But God is God. He has spoken. He's going to do it. I don't know how. I don't know where. I don't know when. But it's going to happen because he is God and he is faithful and he can never fail and he cannot lie. And I heard him. That's how God wants us to live. And he wants us to continue to believe that even when our circumstances may not be changing. You know, you, you receive a promise from God through faith, but you keep it alive through patience. You receive from God, but you keep it alive through patience. There's many people in the scriptures who had a great destiny in God. I'm thinking of Saul. Saul had a great destiny. God said, I'm with you. No one will be able to defeat you. It doesn't matter what everyone, anyone happens to you. I'll be an enemy to your enemies, and I'll fight them all like I did for Asa, like I did for everybody. I myself will enter battles, and you won't have to worry. I'll be your defense. And yet Saul went into a battle where the Philistines, these enemies, they had chariots, they had more soldiers than him. And God had made him this great promise that, that, that he, Saul would not, God, God would not only fight his battles, but he would be God's king and God would establish him and his kingdom would increase and his kingdom would be an eternal kingdom and the Messiah would come through that kingdom. That was a promise to Saul, but he lost it. And you know how he lost it? He lost it through impatience. As he was going to go to that battle against the Philistines, God said, wait for Samuel. Samuel will come and he will declare and decree, offer the sacrifice and prophesy victory over the people. And he didn't wait. And when Samuel says, when he came, he says, today, you've lost the kingdom. I would have established you. I would have done it. I would have performed my word, but now I will not do it. I would have established your kingdom over Israel, but now your kingdom shall not continue. It was all because of impatience. And it began a slippery slope down for Saul because he couldn't, he couldn't wait on God. You know, some people, they, they are just, you can burn for God, you can, you, can, you can walk with God, even trust God for great things for a season. But if you're not patient, if you don't patiently endure with God, uh, you go down. It's like Peter. Peter got out of the boat when Jesus came in the night. And Jesus said, they're in a storm. And Jesus came walking on water. And he said, Peter, Peter looked over and said, I, I think you want me to come. I just, I just need the word. And Jesus said, come. He got the word. And as soon as he got the word, he started to walk, believe in his word. For a while, he walked on water. But then he looked at his circumstances and he went down. He could believe and walk for a little while, but he couldn't patiently endure. And Jesus never even commended him. So we, we, we actually need the ability we need the ability, all the promises of God that he makes to us, they are yes and amen, but they come to us through faith and patience. Believing God 
and continuing to believe God. When Abraham was given a promise, he was given a promise in Genesis chapter 12. God was going to bless the nations through him. Genesis chapter 13, 15, he's going to make so many people out of you. I'm going to make nations come to you. Look at the stars. Look at the stars. I'm going to make, I'm going to make more than the stars from you and your seed. And he had a barren wife. It was impossible. God said, it's going to happen. And for 25 years, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. But for 25 years, God was with and building and being faithful to this man. And Romans chapter 4 says this, I've made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old, the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. Faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able to, persu- to perform. He became fully convinced, or in other translations, he became fully persuaded that God had said it and it didn't matter that the circumstances were, it didn't matter that his wife was post-menopause, it didn't matter that he was 100, it didn't matter that the whole world says it was impossible. There's no, God had said it And my hope and my faith is in God who calls those things that do not exist as though they do. God said it and he speaks things into existence and his word can never, ever, ever fail. And when Abraham got to that place where he believed fully, he was fully persuaded. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. All I know is the word of God cannot fail. God cannot lie. He's my God. He will never lie to me. He's completely faithful. It's going to happen. It happened. When he was fully persuaded, it took 25 years for him to get fully persuaded. But let me, let me, 25 years. Some of us think that we don't have to wait on God. That God makes a promise for a healing or a deliverance or something in your family or a ministry. And, and we think we've waited on God for a year. It's time for God to do it. Let me just tell you something. Let me just tell you something. Jesus When was he the son of God? Some people say he never was. He was just a man, but that's that's lies. He was the son of God at his birth. He was born the son of God. When did his ministry begin? And how long did his ministry last? Three years. How? He started to teach like nobody had ever heard before at 12 years old. Nobody ever heard anything like it. But he had to wait. And he had to wait. And he had to wait. And he had to wait for his word. He had to believe. And he had to wait for his time. I tell you what happens though when we. I've seen this happen many, many times. God makes your promise. And I know how tempting it is to believe for a while. You trust God for a while. But then you think, maybe, maybe what God said to me, it's not just going to happen because He said. Maybe I need to do this, or I need to go here, or I need to help God. Maybe God's said to me, uh, I'm going to bring you a wife or a husband, or a ministry, or a healing, and God's given you his word. And he requires of you to believe him. And as you're waiting, you meet somebody, maybe they're not even a Christian. Maybe they're just a good person. 
deep down in your heart, you've got no witness they're the person God's sending for you. But you say, well, we can make it happen. We can make what God had promised, this paradise relationship, this marriage, whatever, with somebody who, maybe they're not even a believer, but I can do that and I'll, I'll help God and I'll tell everyone this is of God and I'll convince myself it's of God, but it never was. Or maybe it's a ministry. You know, God calls you to do something. Years ago, God called me to preach. I know this myself. God called me to preach. He called me from a young man to preach the Word of God. That's all I do. That's, I'm not good at very many other things, but I can preach the Word of God. I think if you need counseling, you should go to other people. I mean that with all my heart. But God called me to preach the Word of God. But yet, when I left Bible college, I wasn't married. I hadn't met my queen yet, my darling wife, my other half, my better half, my old I hadn't met her yet. And, and so in those days, everyone was saying, you know, you, to be a pastor, you need to have a wife. To be a preacher, you need to have a wife. And so rather than trust God that had spoken to me, you're going to preach, I took this ministry with a ministry called Overseas Council where I went around all the world. I went around all the developing world looking at the needs in all these Bible colleges and, uh, and raising money for all these people to do Bibles and all that sort of stuff. And it was a good work, but it was not God's best. And, and we, we can do this. In, when God makes us a promise, we can create what I call, what the Bible calls an Ishmael. God said to Abraham, I'm going to make a nation out of your wife's womb. That was his promise, just the latent promise of God. And after a season of believing, you see in uh, Genesis 16, they believe God, they trust God, but nothing was happening. And uh, Genesis 16 said, at a certain time, Sarah, Abraham's wife, bore him no son, but he had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, See, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. Then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she conceived, the mistress became despised in her eyes. I won't go on with that story, but uh, they decided that God needed a hand and they created Ishmael through Hagar. Sarah said, well, it's not happening through me. What God said, let's, let's take my maidservant and, and can you believe this? These people are God's people and my husband will sleep with my servant and somehow that's going to work out good. And somehow will say, God has done it. And for many, many years, they, they did that and sort of, sort of believed that. And, and there was just, you know, when you've when you got an Ishmael, the first thing is there's chaos in your house. Chaos everywhere. There's chaos in their home. They're fighting amongst the women. It's horrible when women fight amongst themselves. They're fighting in the house. And, uh, and in the end, God says, because the thing, works of the flesh and the works of the spirit can never live together. The person of the spirit and the person of the flesh can never work together. Ishmael has been created through flesh, through fleshly means, through human plans. And he despises Isaac. Isaac's finally born. Isaac, they finally have Isaac supernaturally. They believe God because God is faithful. His word cannot fail. Finally, they have Isaac. And, and as Isaac starts to grow, Ishmael starts to torment him. And God says to Abraham... Put him out, put, put, which is very, very painful. The death of your Ishmael is always very, very painful. So God says to Abraham, he's got to go. He's got to go for Isaac, for the work of the Spirit, for the work of the promise to flourish. Everything of the flesh has to go. Everything of man has to go. Everything of natural means has to go until it's all by faith. And so God says to him, he says, 
He says, put Ishmael out. But you know what God, God showed me the other day? I got so excited when I saw this. I hope you get excited. This is what God showed me. When God said, put Ishmael out, in Genesis chapter 21, God said, put him out, and it really displeased Abraham because he loved Ishmael by this stage. Ishmael had grown up into a young man, and he loved him. He says, don't let it be displeasing in your sight because of the latter, because of your bondwoman. Whatever has Sarah said to you, put him out. Listen to a voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I'll make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. So God said, put him out. Put your Ishmael out, but I'm still going to make a nation of him because he is your seed. But this is what he said that's going to come out of Isaac. He said, out of Isaac, I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and of the sand, which is the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the, and the gates of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So God said to Abram, he said, Ishmael, I'm going to bless him. Why? Because I'm a good father. God will bless your Ishmael. But it's nothing compared to what comes out of covenant obedience. Did you hear what I said? God will bless your Ishmael if you're impatient. And many people live there. But it's a lot different than what comes out of covenant obedience and patiently believing God's promise. God said, out of Isaac, out of believing my word alone, out of trusting me, something extraordinary is going to happen. Something that flesh cannot produce, something that no man can produce. And you know how God produced it? He said, I'm going to test you whether you believe me. I'm going to test you where you really believe my word. I've given you that child out of out of sheer promise. I've given him out of the power of the Spirit. I've birthed him supernaturally. Now I'm going to test you if you believe me. And he says, I want to take you that thing which I gave you out of nothing. I gave you out of faith alone. I gave you through the power of my word. I gave you your Isaac. Now I'm going to test you. You believe who I am. You believe how faithful I am. Now I want you to sacrifice him. And because Abraham had arrived at that place where he said, I'm fully persuaded. I know my God. My God's word is enough. I I know now if I offer him up, my God will give him back because he gave him to me in the first place. And as soon as he offered him back and he believed God's promise and he trusted in God's word alone that God would be faithful and he would perform and perfect his word, you know where he came to? He came to a place called Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh is not a name of God. It's a place we come to, which is far greater than an Ishmael. It's a place that God brings us to when we see, he sees we believe him. We trust in his word alone. When we walk by faith in the promise of God, he says, I'll bring you to a place called Jehovah Jireh. And Jehovah Jireh is my full provision for your life. God will bless your Ishmael. You say, uh, well... Rather than trust God, I'm just going to work for God. I'm going to do stuff for God. You know, uh, I'll do this, I'll do that. But I won't fully trust and obey Him. God says, I'll bless you because you're my child and I love you. But that place called Jehovah Jireh, where I provide everything, heal you, answer everything, deliver you from every enemy, multiply the blessing that's upon your life. It's only available through those who walk with me by faith and faith alone in my promises. 
And I don't know who I'm talking to here today, but God spoke. I said to my wife this week, I said, oh, I got a word on Wednesday. I said, God will bless your Ishmael because he is good. But that's nothing which comes out of patiently believing in the faithfulness of God's word alone. God's word alone. It's by faith. It's impossible to believe God without faith. And faith believes God rewards those who diligently seek him. So you, you, God says to someone here today, you need to be patient. Just continue to believe me because I love you. You know who, who is able to be patient? I tell you who's able to be patient. Who's able to continue to... Be, you know when you're patient? This is when, you, when, when Christ is your goal, not the promise. You know why? Because I read it earlier today in this, in this sermon. When Christ is your goal, this is how Christ is producing you. You know, God's desire, His greatest desire, His greatest plan is you is not the promise. It's the person of Christ being formed in you. And you say, well, how is Christ formed in me? He says, know this, the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That means that Christ be formed in you through patiently believing God's word, continually believing God's word. Yes, they betrayed me, but I'm still going to love them. Yes, I'm disappointed, but I'm still going to believe you, God. Yes, it's not happening, but I believe it is going to happen. As you patiently just continue in and do that, continue to go through every trial and test, believing God, God is crushing your flesh. He's destroying your anger. He's producing Christ in you. And it's amazing. At the end of Abraham's 25 years of believing, he was able to offer up his son just like God. He became pure and, and mature, lacking nothing. So those who are able to endure know the value of patience. That it's through patience that Christ is being formed in you. In the waiting, in the trusting, I waited patiently. You know, the Bible says the two most repeated commands in the Scriptures, first is fear not, the second is wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. 